Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to this reflection on what it's been like to be a teacher during COVID-19. Um, we're delighted that you've been able to join us today, and we're looking forward to sharing the findings of some research, some reflections from our teacher panellists, and perhaps most importantly of all, hearing from you about um, your experiences and your thoughts on what, what the situation has meant for the teaching profession. Um, before we dig into that in detail, um, there's just a little bit of housekeeping. So in the course of the session, we'll be using a tool called Mentimeter to poll you and get your ideas on various of the topics that arise um, during the course of the session. You can see a slide right now which shows you the details. Um, I strongly recommend that you open Mentimeter now so that you're ready when, when we get to that stage of the session. Um, you go to www.menti.com and type in the code that you can see on the slide. And that code will also be shown in the, um, in the chat as we go through the session. And from there on, it's simple. Um, just type in the answer and submit when you're ready. I would also ask um, if you have questions, and I really hope you do. We very much want this webinar to be interactive and to hear from you as much as you hear from us. Um, but to do that, can you use the Q&A box, which is just at the bottom of your screen, um, rather than the chat box, that will work better. And it's got some very nice features as well in that you can kind of upvote certain questions. So if there's a question in there that you'd really like us to answer if we're short on time, if you vote for it, that will go closer to the top and make it more likely that that's one of the questions that we will engage with. Um, it's possible we won't get to all of the questions, um, so we will prioritise the most liked questions. Um, so yeah, that's Mentimeter and that's, the, uh, that's how the Q&A is going to work. Beyond that, I'd like to introduce our panellists. So today you're going to be hearing from Dr Lisa Kim. Um, and Dr. Laura Oxley. So Lisa works with me at the University of York. I'm Catherine Asbury. Um, Laura works at the University of Cambridge and we've worked together on a project called Being a Teacher During COVID-19. And Lisa and Laura are going to tell you a little bit about the findings from that project. We're also joined by two representatives of the teaching profession. So we have Jen Harvey, who's head teacher of a primary school, and we have Mevish Kauza, who is a secondary school English teacher, and they're going to share their reflections on the findings from our study and then join in a big discussion with all of you as well. We also have um, Lauren Maxey, who is an intern working on the project and is responsible for much of the technical wizardry that makes this kind of web webinar possible. And she's been supported by Steve Parker, who's also with us today. So what we're hoping from today is that this webinar creates an open and an honest space for teachers and those who care about them to reflect on the impact of COVID-19 on individual teachers' working lives and also on the teaching profession as a whole. And we want to use that as an opportunity to reflect and talk about it, but also to think about what we've learned about what it means to be a teacher, about how the teaching profession is managed and um, looked after in our country, and about what we can do to, um, to really take care of teachers moving forward. So I'm going to hand you over now to um, Lisa and Laura, who are going to present some of the findings from our research. So um, hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Lisa Kim, and I'm a lecturer in psychology and education at the University of York in the UK. Um, thank you for joining us in the webinar today. I hope the findings that Laura Oxley and I will be sharing with you will be helpful as we reflect on what it has been like for teachers during the pandemic. In response to the COVID-19 pandemic, schools in England closed for most pupils in, on the 20th of March, 2020. So around 20 months ago. I say most pupils as schools were still open to some, including pupils who are considered to be vulnerable and children of key workers. At that time, much focus was placed on the effect and the potential continued impact COVID-19 would have on pupils and understandably so. As a researcher who studies teachers, I became worried that teachers' stories and experiences may get lost in the pandemic. And so we started the project, Being a Teacher in England During COVID-19 Pandemic. 
with Professor, Professor Catherine Asbury, who's um, chairing this session for us. Um, as a co-investigator, we received funding from the ESRC for this project, which we understand is the only longitudinal qualitative study on teachers during COVID-19. The interviews are approximately 50 minutes each, and our initial sample of participants are 24 primary and secondary teachers with ranging levels of years of experience and teaching in different parts of England. They are both classroom teachers as well as members of SLT, such as head teachers. We have conducted six rounds of virtual interviews so far, and we tried to time them so that they followed significant events. In our interview, we asked our participants questions such as what have been the high points, low points and turning points in your experience as a teacher during the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as what has the nature of their being, a work been like, as well as about their mental health and well-being. We've been able to disseminate our findings to a variety of audiences, including the government through submissions of written evidence and presentations. And we've also written articles and blogs for uh, places like The Conversation and TES. We've also been able to share our findings through academic publications, and we will speak about two of the papers today. As I said, we asked teachers about their high points, low points, and turning points at each of the time points. And the quote that comes to mind is what a secondary teacher shared with us in our first interview, which is, I guess it felt a bit like, you know, you're shown the diagram of how the parachute works, and then you're pushed out of the plane. Looking at our findings from time one and time two, which were times of partial school closures and partial school reopenings, we wanted to find out what themes would emerge from our narratives. At the time of partial school closures, we identified five themes of uncertainty, finding a way, worry for the vulnerable, importance of relationships, teacher identity and reflections. In time two, these themes remained similar though the finding a way changed to uh, practical concerns as teachers um, settled into remote working and focused on solving practical problems at hand. Worry for the vulnerable expanded to worry for uh, concern for pupils as teachers realized that the impact of COVID um, was having an effect on a wider group of pupils. Turning to each theme and a quote that represents them. In the theme of uncertainty, teachers adjusted to the initial shock of the partial school closure of schools, which happened without much warning. Teachers also said that there was a lack of government guidance with one secondary teacher saying, we need clear, uh, clear directions if we're going to move forward. It's as simple as that. Teachers sought to find a way in the changing situations for those with families, they needed to balance how homeschooling would work while teaching their pupils from home. Teachers also talked about needing to solve practical problems such as ensuring that schools were COVID-19 secure with one secondary SLT saying, like doing a giant Sudoku going, yeah, we can't do that because that doesn't do that rule and we can't do that with the whole school, it's even worse because you've got isolated toilets and isolated hand washing facilities in an old building, it's just unworkable. Teachers were naturally worried for their pupils, initially for the vulnerable pupils and their families due to lack of access to technology to engage in schooling and the apparent widening gap. Their concern expanded to a wider group of pupils, which is one, sec uh, one primary teacher said about a child when they came back to school, it was a book that she would have read really easily early on in the year, and she really struggled with it. Even those children that have home lives that you would assume to be better, they're falling behind. Teaching is a social profession and relationships are important, and that with pupils, colleagues, and with parents. Teachers placed importance in connecting with parents, which they would do in various ways, for example, by doing pastoral calls and emailing them. One primary teacher said, 
I think it's just making sure I know for myself I've done my best to communicate with parents. Integral to a teacher's professional identity were routine structure and planning, as well as fairness and, of course, caring for pupils. One primary SLT was proud of what they achieved as a school and as teachers saying, one little boy, after a first day of going back to school, he went home and told his mum it's the best day he'd ever had in school. That's a credit to the school, but that's a credit to the teachers as well. We're very proud of what we've put in place, but also very proud of the ethos and nature of the school. Teachers also shared reflections, which focused on work-life balance and their teaching practices. One primary teacher shared their optimism saying, I think as teachers, we're probably going to uh, come out better because of it, because we're going to have a bit more of, of an understanding and different ways that we can support children. We also asked teachers about their mental health and well-being. And the quote that comes to mind is, my brain feels like a browser with 100 tabs open. As the teacher explained how so many things had to be considered when moving from classroom to classroom with their trolley of resources. Particularly, we wanted to find out what the job demands and job resources were throughout the pandemic. And we asked those questions at times one, three, and four. <clears throat> I will now hand over to Laura, who will discuss the results for us. Thank you. So this graph shows um, the changes in teachers' mental health and well-being over time that we found from, from the interviews within this project. And we've split it by group so that you can see the differences um, between the participants who were part of primary senior leadership team, secondary senior leadership team, and um, primary classroom teachers and secondary classroom teachers. The first point on the graph was taken at time one, which was around April to May in 2020. The second point was taken at time three, which was around July 2020. And the third point was at time four, which was in November. Um, so the trend that we can see in this graph, the trend for almost all the groups is that mental health and well-being declined between times one and times four. And the exception to this was secondary SLT. And from the interview data, it's possible that this is due to the increased support structures that are in place at larger secondary schools and also due to senior school leaders um, having more autonomy compared to classroom teachers. We saw that primary senior leaders um, had a consistent decline in mental health and well-being over time. They were the only group that didn't um, show an increase in mental health and well-being at any point um, within, this, within this project. For, again, from participants' answers within the interviews, this could possibly be due to um, primary schools having smaller senior leadership teams, and therefore there being a lot of responsibility on the shoulders of each individual. We saw that all of the groups declined from time three to time four. Possible reasons behind this could be that time three, um, it was in July, um, so it was towards the end of the academic year. So as it were, there were a light on the on the end of, of the horizon there for teachers, they knew that there was going to be a break. Um, it was also a time when there was a greater availability of social support. We had some national restrictions that were being lifted. It seemed perhaps that we were coming towards, towards the end of the pandemic at that time in July. And so, so these were some of the possible reasons why we saw that increase in teachers' mental health and well-being at that time point. What we can see really clearly from, from this visual of this graph is that it was a non-linear impact, that there were ups and downs um, within teachers' mental health and well-being over time. And one participant described this as being like a roller coaster. Um, we, came, we, came, um, we identified two themes within the interview data looking at teachers' mental health and well-being. Um, so we split these two umbrella themes of job demands and job resources. So job demands are those factors which contribute negatively to teachers' mental health and well-being, and job resources were those factors that contributed positively to teachers' mental health and well-being. We found that there were more job demands than there were job resources. We found um, six job demands, which you can see here was around uncertainty, workload, a negative perception of the prof 
depression, which was coming through in the media and social media, concern for others' well-being and not being able to do as much to support others as they would like to, health struggles, um, this covered both pre-existing health struggles that were exacerbated by the pandemic situation and health struggles that had come about because of the anxiety and stress of the pandemic situation. And then juggling multiple roles, there was a sense of being stuck in the middle of wanting to support families, but also having, having to um, complete certain tasks that they were being asked to do. Job resources, we identified three job resources, um, which were social support, which came through very strongly as being a protective factor for teachers, mental health and well-being, work autonomy and coping strategies. And these were both coping strategies that were pre-existing and those that were developed as a result of the pandemic situation. Um, and I will hand back over to Lisa there to continue talking to you. Teachers have continued to look after the pastoral needs of pupils and teaching them as they oscillated from partial school closures, partial school reopenings and full school reopenings. I hope sharing our findings with you today and in other ways we've outlined early in the presentation, help teachers to feel heard and assured knowing that they are not alone in their experiences. To end, I would like to thank our participants for being so generous and sharing their stories with us and to all the researchers who have been um, involved in the project. And lastly, we'd like to thank teachers all around the world for the valuable contribution that they have to, uh, that they make to our young people's lives. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lisa and Laura. That was that was really fascinating. What I'd like to do now is if um, Mevish and Jen can, um, can join me, I'd like to ask for some of your reflections on the findings that, um, that Lisa and Laura have just shared. So Jen, first of all, can I ask you what, you, what your reaction is as a head teacher of a primary school? Um, I was most interested in the graph that Laura has just showed us because actually that would I would absolutely echo that that um, decline in mental health and well-being um, over a period of time. Um, and I was interested to see that teachers had a slightly hard, fared slightly better in, in primary schools than uh, senior leadership. And I think that's where people have worked really hard to try and protect them um, from that. So, you know, I, I could see that that um, the other thing that really struck me was the negative perception of the profession. And I think the, the, that varied throughout the pandemic. There was almost points of reference right the way throughout it. Initially, when home learning came in, there was lots of praise and recognition of what teachers actually did for their job. And lots of parents who had to try and work with children at home said, I don't know how, you know, I really admire what, what goes on. And, and, and then that declined, um, in my view. And I think the um, confusion with the government guidelines didn't help with that the perception of um, teachers. You know, we were just things were just thrown at schools, really, to get on with it. And I think that that message got across to the wider community. And once we were back and running, that 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 initial admiration seemed to decline somewhat. Yeah, fantastic. Well, not fantastic at all, but um, some really interesting points. And we, I think, we might come back to those in a few seconds. But before we do that. Mevish, how, how did these findings land with you as a, as a secondary school teacher? I think you, right at the start of the presentation, um, Lisa clarified that schools were not in fact closed. And I think that's such an important distinction to make because the only part of that phrase that I think members of the public heard was closed. And there was an assumption that schools are shut. Um, they're completely not open. So despite the follow-up statement of open for vulnerable pupils and, uh, and, and many of the students actually, the general perception was actually we're closed and we're sat at home being paid um, <laughs> for doing nothing, um, which, which is a horrible feeling to have as a professional who works really hard. Um, you know, we love our communities, we love our schools and our students. We were working desperate, desperately hard for them. And then to hear this perception that actually we're sat around doing nothing was, was really heartbreaking actually, and really dispiriting. And the fact that this kind of thing was being churned out by the media, I think if anything took a, a negative effect on our mental health, it was this perception that we weren't doing our bit, that we weren't contributing. Um, and I was part of the team at, at my school where um, we went around on the minibus delivering food parcels. Um, and I don't know if anybody's ever done anything like that, but a, a quite a taxing day of driving around a city that you're not necessarily familiar with in entirely going to people's homes and turning up little parcels and I think the most beautiful part of those 
moments was seeing children who'd, who'd catch sight of me and from their dining room or their living room and rush out because they were so desperate to see someone familiar and say hello and, and just kind of have a chat at the doorway whilst we're passing food over. Um, so the, we did everything we could and I wish that would have been highlighted a little bit more by our media. Yeah, I think that's that's something that we heard from a lot of teachers during the interview and it seems to be a, have been a problem across primary and secondary sectors. I'm interested to know how that's developed as things have gone back to something more like normal. How do you think um, teachers are perceived now with that kind of history of, the, of those COVID perceptions behind them? I think it really does vary in your experience. I think there's some parents who are a little bit resentful um, and feel a little just feel quite tired and feel as though there, there wasn't enough done um, but the reality is we are experts in our subjects sending home powerpoints recorded powerpoints videos trying to do live lessons it's not the same medium what we do is highly skilled and we need our children in front of us to deliver that and so it doesn't matter what we provided us not being in that classroom with those children was not going to it wasn't going to work without that and I think parents resented it thought, well there's perhaps there's maybe more you could do you could do this or and I think there's a lot of comparison lots of schools did a variety of things because the guidance was uh, was quite poor um, so we just did the best that we could do and then there was this I think unpleasant almost comparison that trust is doing this this trust is doing this well actually everybody was just doing the best that they could with the guidance that we had at the time and then we've just had at my school sixth form um, open evening yesterday evening and we had some parents who were right she's definitely staying here for sixth form because actually you did so much and you cared so much and you were there so much so there's quite um quite a lot of difference in people's opinions really yeah it must be nice to get that positive feedback against that more negative media media backdrop mm. Jen can I ask you you referred to the graph that Laura showed where we can see that in terms of mental health and well-being primary SLT primary heads and senior leaders were appear to have been harder hit than other people, mm -hmm. you know, give, uh, given that this was a fairly small sample and we don't want to generalize within the context of this study, that seemed to be the case. W what do you think might explain that? Um, I think Laura did, did refer to the, um, the fact that it's a smaller team in a, a primary school. So you take more responsibility perhaps as well. Um, we obviously also had pupils that much earlier than secondary school, so we had to be ready for that. And that was quite um, it was a new it was a new thing to all of us. So the new learning that went into it was was immense. The other thing that may have contributed is the the methods we have for supporting home learning. Um, where at secondary schools, children were a bit older and able to learn independently. At primary, we had to try and juggle the um, opportunities to, to do tasks they could do independently and also where they would need adult support and then juggling whether there would be adult support available for them so we had to get that combination and I, I don't believe we got it right every time but I think um, as Mervish said we tried, tried our utmost and it was a new way of learning for us too so I think there was a lot of pressure to get that right um, community support was very good with that but I think the media um, perception of things was slightly different and it, it did seem to deteriorate as the pandemic went on. Yeah, how, how could the media have helped? How could they have done things differently so that it didn't have this negative effect? Well, I, I do believe that at the time we were working with a government minister who was putting things out there, um, which caused a lot of confrontation, a lot of conflict. And um, I'm gonna refer specifically to the period of time um, in December last year, in December 2020, where there was the um, possibility of a lockdown, but schools were reopening, with, they're safe, they're not. And, and that caused so much confusion amongst the teaching profession, but also caused a lot of confusion with parents, communities, and, and the general public, because, you know, is it safe, isn't it safe? Are the teachers making a fuss about it, or are they actually genuinely concerned for the health and welfare of the pupils and the staff? Um, so that that really didn't help. I'll, I'll say that much. I'll be trying to be tactful. <laughs> okay, thank you, Jen. Can I ask about workload? Um, so one of the things that our participants talked about in terms of their well-being was their workload. Would you say that during the pandemic you had less work 
more work or the same amount of work, but just different in, in nature? How did it feel to you? Uh, Mevish, would you like to go first? Sure. I think when we're talking about teaching workload, what people typically think of is the planning and the PowerPoints and um, the kind of delivery and the recording of PowerPoints. I think what people forget is actually there are several members of the profession, there's a quite a chunk actually, who are not particularly au fait with technology who are uh, chalkboard teachers almost. So I am part of a team where we vary in age from someone who's retiring this year um, to somebody who is 22 and blogs regularly and posts online regularly. And so the workload was actually about upskilling furiously um, and really quickly recognizing the lack of investment in technology that schools have had because our children are savvier at tech than we are actually. They know how to record a three minute TikTok quicker than I could work out how to record a PowerPoint, I'll tell you that much. Um, and I'm a fairly younger member of our team. Um, so the workload was, was exacerbated by the fact that we had to upskill very quickly. And that caused quite a lot of tension because it's, that's exhausting. Our cognitive load was quite high and that was before we even got to delivering the content that we're familiar with. So I think it's not just the typical that we were dealing with is very quickly upskilling and then doing trying to do what we would normally do that really exacerbated things for us. Thank you. I think upskilling furiously might be um might be the title of this title of this video. <laughs> um, Jen, is there anything you'd like to add to that before we move on to a broader discussion? No, I, I agree with the upskilling, and I think the upskilling um, was very rapid, um, and it, it I agree that the, the technology wasn't quite there to support that in some places, and there was a lack of investment previously. The upskilling itself has caused a, a, a lot of caused a lot of fatigue actual fact it's new learning every day um, and that brings <laughs> brings some you know some elements of uh, brain ache if you like and that, that I think that added to the workload the one also for us when children came back but were having to isolate and you're providing work at home as well as trying to teach the class that really increased workload and that's still going on now and that's still an issue now yeah Okay, thank you very much. Well, thank you for um, your response to Laura and Lisa's presentation. Laura and Lisa, can I ask you to switch your cameras on now as well? And we'll move into a, a, a broader discussion. So my first kind of big, big picture question, um, and you can draw on your own experience and that of the people around you, is how, how do you think teachers felt during the pandemic? And we're going to have a Mentimeter poll at the same time so that our audience can... Um, can chip in with with their points of view on this as well. So, um, Jen, would you like to to comment on that? I think uh, from from our point of view, there was a real determination to get as much done as they could. I saw a real professionalism with all the teaching staff, um, a positivity um, and and enormous resources that they drew on, enormous strength of character to be able to do all that. Um, they felt anxious. And they felt anxious about their safety and about people's safety. At times they felt very stressed. They felt the messages were not clear. Um, and that took a lot of wading through. And that's possibly linked back to what we said about senior leaders in primary schools having to try and get all that sorted. Um, but I think they um, generally were very, very positive and, and kept going. The effects now, I would say, were probably more pronounced. And perhaps during the pandemic, we were still in crisis mode and still in survival yeah. mode. That's very interesting. And it's nice to hear about the, that kind of positive and persevering response. And I think we heard that in our interviews. It's very interesting that in the in the word cloud that the Mentimeter is producing while we're chatting, um, we're not seeing quite so many positive um, adjectives. And that might reflect what you're saying, that teachers at this stage are a little bit more weighed down because we're because we've moved on from that kind of fight or flight response yeah. situation that we were in but lots of the words that you mentioned about anxiety and stress are, are there in, in in large print um mevish how would you say teachers felt during the pandemic 
Obviously, I'm an English teacher, so one word is never enough. I'm going to take through a couple of metaphors at you, ladies. So mind my verbosity. Um, swanning, I think, is a metaphor that comes to mind. So this idea that on the top, everybody tried to look really calm, really focused, keep it together in front of the kids and in front of fellow professionals and colleagues. Um, and underneath, you're furiously paddling, trying to keep everything going. Um, and Jen, I'm not sure if you'd agree, but I felt like our senior leadership, particularly at my school, um, they were this absolute strong umbrella they shouldered so much mm. um, they took so much weight of the guidance being thrown at us um, of parents of, of complaints of all these things just to try to keep us teachers kind of somewhat safe um, in our zones to be able to just teach and I looked at some of our leaders when I was going in and the poor things I did not resent them their jobs they were exhausted they were really tired I think at one point um they hadn't had any any break at all I think in September they'd had six days total that my boss could say to me that he'd had where he'd not looked at a computer um and even then that wasn't without the mental fatigue of worry of the next what was going to happen next so yeah so swanning and umbrellas is what you'll get from me yeah, I think I think they're great metaphors. And again, I think that does chime with our data. I think headship is always a difficult job. And over the last 20 months, it's been an extraordinarily difficult job. I wonder, um, I don't know if, um, well, anyone who would like to can jump in on this. One of the big words that I'm noticing on this word cloud is lonely. Um, and I'm not sure that that's something our participants talked about a great deal. Um, Jen, do you think it was a lonely time for teachers? Um, yes, I think there was an element of loneliness. Don't forget, we're used to teaching in social situations. We teach in a class full of children um, and suddenly you're in a room on your own with a camera. Um, and there was a sense of loneliness and, and a sense of, am I doing the right thing? You know, who's reassuring me about this? So, yes, I do, I do agree with that. Yeah, actually, that's an interesting way of looking at it, because uh, I'm aware that our teachers talked a lot about the importance of relationships and they really missed their yeah. colleagues and their pupils and those interactions. Um, and yeah, that, it makes sense that that's then expressed as a, as a, as a kind of loneliness. Um, mm -hmm. I hadn't quite thought about it from that emotional side. So that's that's interesting. OK, um, I'm going to move on to the next question now. So we've talked about sort of emotions and how it felt to be a teacher during the pandemic. Um, I want to think more um, broadly now about the, the profession as a whole. And how do you think COVID has affected the teaching profession? Um, Mevish, would you like to comment on this? See, it's interesting as a, as a teaching profession, I think it's done as probably great damage in terms of the public perception of us. Um, and I worry, I worry about um, our trainees and the people who are new to the profession. I was also a mentor throughout this time. And I know there's also already awful statistics about losing teachers within the first five years and whatnot. Um, and so I really worry about how we're going to retain these people who are coming in, who, who've in future teachers who really want to be teachers, but have seen how we're treated and think, I don't really want any part of that, actually. And that worries me because we're going to lose so many talented, hardworking people. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm quite interested. I'm looking at the details that are coming in on the poll and we've only had a few um, people respond so far. But the poll asks, um, COVID has had a negative effect on the teaching profession. Um, and we've got a real diversity of opinion here. We've got someone who strongly agrees, a couple of people who agree, and a couple of people who, who disagree. Um, Jen, I wonder what your thoughts are on this. I, I think there's a balance to be struck because there has been some, some bizarre positives. <laughs> um, we have upskilled ourselves. We have found how resilient we are as a workforce. We have been able to adapt to things. But for me, the negative effect is the kind of what I call COVID fallout. It's those people who then burn out and go off on long term sick and, and then, as Mevish said, you know, may leave the profession. And that's where I think the negative effect have been. So there is a balance. There is a little bit of both. I see that through the results as well. Mm. Lisa, can I bring you in on this one? So as, as someone with academic expertise in the teaching profession, what do you think the impact of COVID has been? I uh, thank you, Jen and Mavash, for sharing your insights so far. Um, I'm trying to reflect on what our participants have shared with us. And indeed, I think I shared in one of the quotes um, early in the presentation that 
um, there have been teachers who recognize that they will come um, stronger and better out of this. Um, that, that will be the positive side with our upskilling and all these kind of content, um, how to present and how to teach in a remote setting as well as in a hybrid setting. And I'm sure that is kind of, and then the use of technology for marking as well. I think that's also something that's been um, slow to be introduced as well. But I do worry about teacher stress and teacher burnout. So we know, um, so a definition of burnout would be some of the symptoms would be emotional exhaustion and feeling distant from people and work mm -hmm. and such that they become objects rather than people or, or things that bring people joy. And I do, um, and, and when we think about burnout, it is a result of um, high job demands and that is not being um, kind of buffered out by the job resources. So the greater the job demands someone experiences, um, the greater the likelihood that someone will experience burnout. Also, um, the greater uh, someone experiences job resources, so that could be social support, um, the greater they will be in their work engagement. So if we have lots of job demands, but little job resources, um, the likelihood that someone will experience um, prolonged, uh, prolonged stress, which would then lead to burnout is higher. So I do I do worry for teachers because COVID has been such an up and down, up and down situation. Things needed to be responded to so quickly, especially as Jen talked about with primary schools needing to respond earlier than secondary schools as well. I do, I do wonder what we could be doing to um, support the teaching profession in their mental health and well-being, and also in their effectiveness because a teacher who is well mentally and emotionally is also a teacher who is effective in the classroom as teacher because Teach, a teacher is not only someone who instructs, they're also um, emotional contagion. So whatever a teacher ex, um, experiences in their emotion, uh, students can feel that as well. And that also influences their motivation and their emotional, um, social and emotional well-being. So yeah, I, I think there's been ups and, um, ups and downs. And I do wonder how teachers are feeling now and how they, will, how, how they view the future from now. Fantastic. Thank you, Lisa. Um, while we're still on this question, some of the, something that's come up quite a bit in um, Jen and Mevish's comments relates to media portrayals of the profession and government communications with the profession. Um, I wonder if you'd like to say a little bit more about how both of those things have affected the status of the profession or the desirability of the profession or the, the sense of pride or otherwise that people might feel in being a member of the teaching profession. Jen, would you like to go first? Um, I think the, the dealings we've had with the um, government actually have been on the whole negative, if I'm honest. Um, and I think that that really affects the way people think and the way they feel that you know, they're viewed. Um, and I won't go into specific examples, but it, it's had a really negative impact on some of the people there. So um, people who've perhaps retired early, um, gone to a different job, um, and it has affected I think, the workforce in particular. OK, thank you, Jen. Um, Mevish, is, would you like to add to that? Am I allowed to be less diplomatic? <laughs> <laughs> we said it's an honest and an open space, so you can say whatever you like. <laughs> um, I think we need to divorce politicians from education. It's time they left each other alone. Um, education requires routine. It requires consistency. It requires calm. And it requires the placing of the professionals first so the professionals can put the children first. And unless that happens, we're not going to be able to battle all these negative effects. So we just want calm, clear consistency, which so many of our leaders in education do provide for us already. We just need the politicians to probably calm down a little bit too. Okay, thank you very much, Mevish. Okay, I'm going to ask one more question before we open up to questions from our audience. And I can see there are a few coming in in the Q&A box already, but do feel free to um, pack them in there and we will answer as many as we can in the final 15 minutes of this session. But the, um, the other question I wanted to ask first was, and it, I, it's quite nice, it builds on Jen's positive points from earlier. What lessons have we learned from COVID-19 COVID that we'd like to take 
forward. Um, Mevish, would you like to go first? Lessons learned. Sheer resilience of our profession, don't we think? We, we survived. We, we're still here. We're still teaching. I'm back in my classroom with my students. Parents still came in through the doors last night and they'll come back in when we have our next parents evening. Um, sheer resilience. The fact that we're still standing over here. We can do it. We just, we needed strategy. Um, and we developed it quite quickly overnight. Sometimes Jen did, I imagine, um, to us, how on earth you're going to socially distance primary school with children. I have no idea how you did that. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so yeah, so just our sheer resilience is, is one of the big things I've learned about my colleagues and how kind we are, how incredibly kind our profession is and our leaders are. It's a huge one for me. Mm. Fantastic. Um, Jen? Um, for me, um, I, I agree with um, Mavish totally. The one thing that we did learn as a primary school and as a primary profession was that we don't need tests to know where our children are. And the removal of the tests last year was very welcome and it allowed us to think about the whole child, which when emotional health and well-being is such a high priority, it allowed us to think much wider. We prepared our children for secondary school much better last year, even though they may not have visited because we didn't have the pressure of the tests. Um, and I have to say, it does dismay me that we've got more tests this year than ever before. Um, and there were no adjustments made to any of those. We didn't need them and we learned that really clearly we knew exactly where the children are we know where the gaps are we'd like more funding to be able to fill them but we know what we're doing and and that was for us was a huge lesson really we knew we could do it anyway but being trusted almost <laughs> to do it we learned a lot from that interesting thank you very much um from the point of view of the study um laura can i ask you is there anything that you feel that we saw in the data that represents a lesson that we could kind of take forward? I think um, the importance of um, our social support networks was really highlighted by the study. And it's maybe something that we, we took for granted before, you know, that we'd never had a situation where we were suddenly told you can't see people and um, you, you can't actually be in the same room as people. And particularly, as Jen mentioned earlier, for teachers who, who are, you know, used to being in a classroom full of children and being with their colleagues and and for that suddenly to be taken away um, I think the participants suggested that that did have a big impact and that the um, occasions where they were able to have some of that social support so at the time three when it was sort of digital, July time when some of those um, restrictions were being lifted and that social support was more available um, that was something that, that had a positive impact on mental health and well-being and so that just sort of valuing that that social support and valuing those networks Fantastic. Thank you, Laura. And what about you, Lisa? Do you have a reflection on something that struck you in the data that it would be good to take forward? So I'm reflecting on one of the papers that we published with Laura and you uh, about what makes a great teacher during a pandemic. And we, when we asked our participants, what makes a great teacher during a pandemic? And then um, is that also relevant after the pandemic as well? We found two themes. So one being caring for pupil well-being, and then the other being dealing with uncertainty. So I can, uh, what, what that tells me is teachers really do value um, relationships with pupils and caring for them. And that's just an inherent part of the profession. Another part is they are really resilient. Um, and we've seen that in the uh, pandemic. Um, it is really unfortunate that the situation has thrown, that so many balls have been thrown at the profession throughout this time. But yeah, they've been really resilient and we're, we're really, really thankful that they've been able to continue on and to continue to teach our pupils and look after the well-being of the pupils as well. Fantastic. So we're, we've learned that teachers are resilient, that teachers are kind, that teachers care about their pupils. We've learned that maybe those primary school tests aren't as important as we were told they were. And we've learned that, um, that, that social relationships really matter to teachers and make a difference to their mental health and well-being in, in their job. And I'm sure we've learned a ton besides. And um, if people want to put comments in the Q&A about what we've learned, as well as asking questions, then that's completely fine. But we're going to move over to your questions now, um, and I will try to follow them. So we've got um, a question here. Teaching has always, always been, by its very nature, a community endeavour. This community element expanded exponentially during lockdowns. Were you able to maintain your work-life balance? 
and what was the impact? Um, Jen, would you like to answer that one? Um, I think for us during the pandemic, because the, you, you know, you're absolutely right, community is a huge part of it. We prioritised that. And I think it, it almost went above the learning. You know, we were in survival mode. We needed our families to be safe and OK. Um, and I think because we prioritised it, it didn't actually, our workload was focused on that. It was when we were trying to do both, but things got much more difficult. Um, where you were trying to focus on the learning and you really realised that this was going to go on for some time. And once that, once we had that realisation, we were trying to do much more to support learning as well. And that, that's where workload increased. Thank you, Jen. Um, Mevish, I wonder, is there any kind of primary, secondary distinction here or did you have a similar experience? I think um, Jen's comments about, oh, what's that adage, weighing the pig? The incessant testing, the minute we get them back, um, kind of took over. And if I'm really honest, when we had the children back in the classroom, um, then the biggest concern as a teacher was, well, actually, I'm now in a physical space um, with 1,200 students in a, quite a big secondary school. Um, and what that meant was I worked more than ever, to be honest, um, because your social life was so inhibited anyway. We weren't seeing people. And then the reality is, actually, as teachers, you're the one who poses the risk in your family to everyone else, because even the people who are involved in the medical profession in my family were, had PP, were far more protected than I was. And in fact, in my family, the teacher was the one who got COVID. <laughs> and so unfortunately, what meant was I didn't have much of a work-life balance. I worked an incredible amount just because I, I couldn't socialise. I was desperate to stay away from any elders and be vulnerable. Um, so it kind of shifted the other way. I threw myself into work and I think it took the summer holidays before I had had seven, eight to seven to 10 days away from children and other people and was definitely tested negative that I got to kind of breathe and have a break and, and, and yeah, it's that not very Brilliant. positive there, is it? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. If I may you. add to that, um, some of yeah. the participants were talking about, especially on the first lockdown, I think that was quite a, a shock, a period of shock. So they were trying to figure out, okay, what technology should I be using to, um, to try to compensate what, um, uh, to replace the kind of in-person teaching. And for some schools where they were, um, which was lowest um, social economic status, trying to print out or create paper packs so that they're going to deliver them um, to the schools. So I tried, on top of that, with the homeschooling, so with the, um, with, the, with the participants who had children of their own who needed to keep teaching their own, you know, children, as well as the pupils that they would usually teach at school, balancing that I think was quite difficult. And I think um, with the, uh, as the pandemic progressed, um, allowing the, allowing the um, I guess, the key workers children, so that there was the definition of key workers and vulnerable children expanded a little bit. So they were able to send their kids, to, um, which helped a bit. But yeah, thinking about their kind of uh, family situation, as well as learning the technologies. And then I think later in the pandemic, the schools also wanted consistency in terms of how the teaching would be taught. So they needed to learn the technology that the school wanted them to use, which added to that kind of difficulty. Um, so, yeah, wow. <laughs> a lot, it was a lot. Fantastic, and thank you for the question. We've got another one now. Um, whilst very challenging, do you think there have been any enduring positives from the accidental upskilling that should be taken forward? And um, Mevish, would you like to have a go at that one? This is really interesting, actually, because it, it went two ways. You realise that, the value of turning all the tech off and just standing at the front and teaching and how irreplaceable that is and at the same time for things like home learning it's very quickly taught us how we could better utilize that um yet to kind of flip the learning and use it in a to encourage student independence particularly at secondary school in order to prepare them for higher education so it is dual it's double fold there actually which is funny isn't it it's gone the other way, yeah. So one without tech completely, we are irreplaceable. That that degree level knowledge in a secondary school with a teacher who has that degree knowledge is irreplaceable. But actually the tech can support that, um, just not all the time. And perhaps more for home learning than anything else to, to encourage independence and academic resilience. Fantastic. Jen, do you have thoughts on that one? 
Um, I think there, there is a level of, a level of upskilling that has been really, really useful. And it's, it's given us quite a brave workforce where, where we had people who were very reluctant to use certain things. They've had to. Um, and now they're quite confident in it. And, you know, we've never really heard of Zoom before, <laughs> before this, to be honest. <laughs> and now, you know, we have really successful parents who do on Zoom. And, and it's upskilled parents as well, upskilled children. And I think in terms of primary teaching, it's, it's helped us prepare our year six children for secondary better because we can use platforms in a similar way to secondary schools. And I think that's helped, that's definitely had an impact there. Fantastic. I think we heard in our data there was a lot of love for the virtual parents evening, um, but there was also a sense that um, that these methods are ways to support children who, for whatever reason, might find it difficult to attend school, even when they're the minority. So your school refuses or children with an accident that means they can't come to school, but who are well enough for learning. So I think there are there are signs that there's some some good in there. OK, let's move. Oh, sorry. So, so sorry, Catherine. So I think some parents really commented to me how, because there were some parents who just could not get to school on time for parents' evening. Um, that's the reality, no matter how late we pushed it. And for them, for those parents, it was brilliant. It was a video chat for 10 minutes rather than them having to drive for 40 minutes from work to get there. And then for those five minutes, and it, that the parents invaluable, absolutely. Sorry, I'll let you continue. Thank you. No, no, that's absolutely fine. Um, okay. Can I add to your point, oh, sorry, um, about you, you were talking about um, supporting school refusers um, to work at home. We had a boy with um, yeah, ME who uh, we were able to provide really well for him after the pandemic, where we would have found that much more difficult um, previously. So there are some benefits there. Yeah, well, it's, it's, really, it's really nice to hear some of the positives alongside all of the more difficult stuff. Okay, so here's another question. Um, how should we be managing the gap between those who have modern IT and modern communication and those who don't? Is this a school problem to solve, a local authority problem or a national problem? Can it be solved? Um, and the comment is it's probably a thesis in itself, but who'd like to have a go at this one? Lisa, I know this is something you've thought about quite a lot. Would you like to try and answer this one? I'm just trying to process the question a little bit. So managing the gap between those who have modern IT and modern communication. So, yeah, I think I started a little, um, talking about it a little bit, um, how students, so oh, the, the, the story that one of the teachers shared with us comes to mind. So she was um, sharing that when the government was distributing the laptops, um, she was able to um, give, offer these to certain parents and the pupils. However, the parent didn't want to receive the laptop because that would mean that she would need to sign the form, which means that if the laptop was damaged, that the parent would need to pay for it, but they didn't have the means to do so. Therefore, the, the parent decided not to take the laptop. So that is, I think, quite, um, a sad um, situation that the resource is there, but they, but so the government could offer this and the school can offer this, but then we also need to think of the perspective of the pupils and their families if they're able to receive what um, they're able to, what they've been offered. And then another scenario that comes to mind is that um, I think at the beginning of um, lockdown, schools and the government wanted to find out how much access to the internet um, pupils had so that they could work out whether they're able to engage with homeschooling that way or remote teaching. To a question, do you have internet access? A pupil might answer that saying, yes, I have internet access, but that's through my mom's phone. But the question to that, <laughs> to what is being posed is, yes, I have internet access. So we need to think about, yeah, the question, we might mean something, but how is it being received to the other person? And I think there's that gap and we need to be, I think that's where the collaborative conversations between different parties come into play. What, 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 are, what, what are the problems here? How can we solve this together? Is this what you're understanding my question to be? And how can we work together to solve that? I think it's really important. 
Fantastic. Thank you, Lisa. We are nearly out of time and we want to put up a poll for one more question. It feels like we could keep talking for at least another hour, but we are nearly out of time. So I'm going to ask a question and Lauren's going to put a poll up. How can we support the teaching profession moving forward? I can see that um, our audience have already got ideas in here, greater support and resources for mental health. Just a simple thank you, um, appreciation, support, communications, better communication, don't make assumptions. Um, so lots of ideas there, uh, recognize that they're not just a service, that teachers are, are a bit different to that. I don't know, just in a minute or so, Jen, what would, what would you say? Um, I would say that it was interesting, actually, Lisa, thank everybody um, at the beginning of the presentation and, and that I, I found that really valuable. It's not often we've had public thank yous, I think. You know, some people have said it, but it hasn't been, um, or it hasn't felt recently like we've had a public thank you. Um, so I do think a thank you is really important. I think a recognition of the difficulties facing teachers is really important right now. So that will include things like support for mental health, support for well-being, but particularly support for workload and a recognition of the workload issues that are faced by the profession. Uh, the demands have just increased since we've returned. So in terms of work-life balance and in terms of workload, the teachers are in a worse position at the moment. Um, than they have been since March 2020, I would say that if we were following uh, Laura's graph from earlier, it would go right down even further now. Um, I, I do think that it's it's got to be understood what the fallout has been, not just in this profession, mm -hmm. but certainly the expectations have ramped up, but the support network hasn't really. Interesting. Thank you, Jen. We're going to be interviewing the teachers in the study again in March, and so it'll be interesting to see if your hypothesis is, is supported. Um, Mevish, just in 30 seconds to a minute, what would your response be to this question? Um, nuanced conversations, um, like this is just highlighted with what she said, asking the right question is really valid. You need to get the question right before or you um, look at the answer and say, right, that's done. So nuanced conversations, not just st statements or, or questions that are flawed. Um, layers of workload need to be stripped back. We need to have a really evidence-informed approach, a strategic approach in how we are teaching students and using the new tech. That doesn't mean that we take everything we used to do, we've added a whole bunch of new stuff to it, now we're doing everything and we don't really have time for it. We need to look at what we need to strip away and only focus on that which is most effective according to the evidence and have that in our classrooms. Fantastic, thank you very much Mevish. I'm super conscious that we've got questions here that we haven't had time to answer. And we've got one comment which is from a team of researchers who've also been um, looking at what schools have been doing during COVID and shared some resources. So I don't know, Lauren, if it would be possible for us to share that link with the audience afterwards so that can be shared, that would be really good. Um, and I'm sorry about the questions we didn't get to, but thank you so much. Thank you for coming and thank you for engaging so well and for such fantastic questions. And I would especially like to thank Jen and Mevish for being here today and sharing their personal experiences. It's been um, really valuable. Um, thank you to Lisa and Laura for presenting the results of the study. And thank you to Lauren and Steve for making it all work. We think it all worked. And now we're all gonna be YouTubers and the kids will respect us much, much more. So this is all good. Um, so yes, thank you so much. Um, I hope you have found this a good opportunity to reflect on what it's been like to be a teacher during COVID-19 and perhaps to reflect on, you know, the situation hasn't gone away and um, the burdens that are placed on teachers' shoulders certainly haven't gone away. As Jen just mentioned, that they're actually increasing at the moment. And so to think about how we might be able to support the profession, whether that's through research or through policy or through media coverage. Um, so hopefully um, it's an opportunity to think about those important issues. Um, for the audience, we will be sending out a survey after this, um, partly to find out how you found the, the webinar, um, but also um, 
because we want to ask you about a few other things. And um, we would really appreciate your views and reflections um, to help inform our research moving forward. But for now, it is seven o'clock. Um, I'm sure you all have dinner that you're very keen to eat. Um, and we really appreciate you being here. So thank you. And thank you to teachers. You do a wonderful job. <laughs>